has been winter wheat and, and it should have been winter wheat and carried it a little bit of just an image or two of some barley because of the damage that it showed early on. Uh, but I think that's where we need to have our primary focus here is, and that's what we do a lot of. There is some interest in growing rye and somebody just nod their head or say yes, you can see the screen and it's showing rye for Kentucky or rye in Kentucky right now. Somebody give me a thumbs up on that and let me know that that's working right. So, um, okay, thank you, Matei, I appreciate that. So historically rye in Kentucky, a uh, hundred years ago or before we were growing some rye in the state, about a hundred years ago or so, about the time of prohibition, it really kind of fell out. Uh, and I think it lost some acreage to a lot of other crops that were coming on strong at that time. And uh, uh, crops that were just able to outcompete it overall from a yield and economic standpoint. We've got a lot of farmers that have been growing some rye for cover crop and they're interested in growing rye for grain. We've got some distilleries in the state that are interested in having rye at the local level as well. And so it seems like a perfect storm of events that's got us to study in some rye. And so we were very fortunate that um, uh, a philanthropy group called Dendra Fund, which is uh, somewhat affiliated with Brown Foreman, sent uh, uh, two farmers and, and me over to Germany and Poland to see how they grow rye and get some, some feedback with it. Um, Don Halcom was on this trip and really enjoyed it. Learned a lot about rye while we were in Germany. Um, and we learned that a lot of farmers were growing it. We saw that they had a big market for it. And so we came back really enthused by it except we knew we had some challenges. And one of those is if you see in this particular uh, image, you can see that Northern Europe is about 52 to 54 latitude north, and we're about 37 to 38, depending upon where you are in the state of Kentucky. So a very different latitude, very different climate. But the good news is, is that when our farmers went over to England and looked at wheat production about 40 to 30 years ago, Dave, those latitudes are about the same thing. They're about 52 to 54 in England as well. And so you're, you're looking at relatively similar climates uh, that you're dealing with and differences that way. So that gave us some, some uh, courage that maybe we could figure out rye uh, like we did wheat uh, over the years. And so I'm gonna walk you through some rye just here at Spindletop. Uh, I tried to do a video. I wasn't as good of a videographer as what Travis was. And so that one's been scrapped and, uh, and written up as a learning system, but Early on, the rye was, uh, it germinated pretty quickly uh, by October 28th. We had two different planting dates, of October 1st and October 18th. We didn't get rain until pretty much right before we planted the second time. So both of them came up almost at the same time. They're at the same growth stage right now out in the field, not, a, not much difference at all. This hybrid rye, Bill talked about hybrid rye in his variety trials. If you look at it early in the season, it grows low and kind of squat to the ground. It looks more like a like a crabgrass or something like that early on. And, and if you can see off in the distance here, um, where's my option to annotate? If I, you can just see right back in here, here's some wheat. And at this point in time, on April the 3rd, that wheat's actually taller than the rye. And that goes on for, for quite a while throughout the season. Uh, we get into about April 27th and the rye starting to grow more upright, starting to get a little more erect. Um, and then we get about May 4th, we started to see some heads come out. And so just like with the wheat, we're monitoring that rye to see whether, whether or not we've got freeze damage occurring in the heads and reproductive areas. But by that May 4th, that rye now was about um, 36 inches tall, give or take a little bit. It's much more uneven of a crop than wheat. And that means the heading is a little bit more uneven, flowering is a little bit more uneven. Uh, rye is an obligate outcrosser, so that means it has to pollinate another plant, whereas, as, as Dave told you earlier, that wheat pretty much is a self-pollinator, rye must cross-pollinate, it must cross-pollinate. And because of that, the Germans told us to do absolutely nothing during pollination, and we said, well, what about head scab? And uh, the Germans said, don't worry about head scab, it's an issue for barley and wheat, it's not an issue for rye for us, and so, don't do anything at all during, during pollination um, and don't worry about head scab. Well, that may have worked for Germany, but it didn't work for here. And so we found out that rye is highly susceptible to head scab, just like wheat is. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, Ella, who's from Poland, working on rye genetics with Dave. Uh, and then Julia, my technician, and Dan, my grad student, we're all out trying to assess head scab damage in fields that we did not spray with fungicide where the rye had uh, some pretty bad scab issues. And so 
Some of the things that we think we've learned up to this point and some of the things that we're suggesting is, is that we stick with the hybrid rye like Bill's been testing, that we can use a lower seeding rate than wheat. Uh, we can plant earlier. Uh, for cover crop, we can plant rye late, but for seed, for grain, we need to plant it early. At least that's what we're seeing so far. Uh, we've got to manage for scab and we have some good data, thanks to Carl Bradley and, and Carrie Knott, working with us to, to help develop some good data on that, that we can be effective at controlling scab with some of the fungicides. Overall, we're gonna use a lower nitrogen rate. And right now our yields are highly fluctuating. And so the yields fluctuate anywhere from 30 to 100 bushels per acre. And we're trying to fast track rye a little bit relative to what we did with wheat production. And so we had four farms last year that grew 25 acres each. We've got, I think it's eight or nine farms this year that are doing it. This is one up in, uh, uh, Northern Kentucky up on the river, uh, log house farm. This is actually an organic rye field. Uh, looks beautiful in, on April 16th uh, when I was out there uh, scouting that particular field. Um, one good thing is, is that uh, Carrie had three temperature sensors, temperature relative humidity sensors that we could borrow and put in these fields. And so we set them up to roughly be at head height and the, the negative is, is we have to go to the field and pull the sensors off and download them to a computer. So we're not gonna download these until we get to the end of the season. So we don't have these numbers immediately to work with, but we are getting numbers, I think for every hour in three of these fields across the state. This one is uh, one in Washington County with Homestead Family Farms. And this is one down in um, uh, Logan County with Walnut Grove Farms. And at the time that these were all taken, these fields looked excellent and phenomenal and so, we'll find out whether or not um, uh, the freeze has hurt the yield potential on any of these. Uh, I should have mentioned across the bottom, we now have a larger project. Uh, we're working with uh, American Farmland Trust with the Small Grain Growers and Dendra Fund. And with their support, we went to the uh, Kentucky Ag Development Board and we were able to get funding through them to support up to 20 farms total on 25 acres. And so what we're doing is doing a bit of a price guarantee on these 25 acres. Where we'd ideally like to get rye up to 70 or so bushels per acre if it's going to be somewhat competitive and, and go into our crop rotation. Um, but we're not there yet. And so Ag Development Board's helping us out this year uh, and next with, with growers to, to guarantee some revenue. And in turn, we're asking the growers to follow our guidelines as close as, we, as, close as they can and we're hoping at the end of this to learn how to grow rye a little bit more quickly than just relying on plots alone. And so I think we're, with that being said, I think we've got some good people in place. Last year, uh, Woodford Reserve bought some rye off of three of the farms. They ran batch samples on each of those, ran it through their labs, went, went to the taste testers and everything else. And it turns out we can grow good quality rye here in Kentucky, at least we did last year. And so We'll see what this year uh, ends up being with, with some of the weather events. I think I'm going to 